Well, hello and welcome to episode number 31 of the Wonder of Stuff Vodcast broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air every Sunday. Uh, this is the place where you'll find news, information and commentary on science, engineering and technology from the past week and beyond and anything else that interests us from inside our tiny little brains. Uh, as ever, my name is John Gardner and to uh, help us out on this journey to knowledge, uh, let me introduce my colleagues Richard Smith and Ross Davidson. Say hello, chaps. Hello, chaps. Jolly good. All had good weeks? Very good, yeah. Excellent. So Bit of sun, uh, Bit of sun, yes. I mean, nice you change your name by Deadpool one episode, and then when you say, as ever, my name is no longer John <laughs> Interesting you think about changing your need by Deadpool, absolute rubbish. You, there's no Deadpool. You no, just, no, you just decide to call yourself something else. You get yourself a, a sort of a standard uh, legalese letter to say that I will, I, I will not be called this from now on. I will be called this. You get a few people to sign it. That's it. Well, that's even better. You can get that done during the course of next week, and then <laughs> yeah, it does screw you up on financial documents and other things uh, further Basketball. down the line. But uh... <laughs> plane tickets, stuff like that, are there? Yeah, yeah. Not, not to be, not to be, you know, jumped into that sort of thing. But someone uh, but did it's... that. Uh, someone did that because it was cheaper than uh, getting a change to that plane ticket. They just changed their name to the misspelling. It, well, it is. It's free. You, you, essentially, there, there are there are companies that do it, but uh, that you can just download a template from the internet, and it's fine. That's uh, what. That might be cheap, but presumably changing all your IDs isn't that cheap. Well, yeah. I mean, but um, for instance, my wife did it because uh, her her uh, sur uh, well, obviously, we were getting married, so we were going to change the surname anyway. Um, but she she's her. There was some mix-up when she when she was born, and on the birth certificate, it's the English spelling of her name, which is she's Welsh, so not the not the Welsh spelling. So she's changed it on the, the Welsh spelling, so now she is how she, she's always termed herself that throughout her life. But uh, certain documents did, had the English spelling, certain documents had the Welsh spelling. So it's all changed now. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> on with the show. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, with uh, uh, one of mine, um, uh, big fish, little fish. Cold fish, warm fish, uh, cardboard box fish. Um, so, uh, we're going to start a, 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 a question to you both, actually. So, um, animals, you'll be aware of them. I am aware of that. Yes, good. Um, so, we have, we have sort of like um, amphibians and reptiles and mammals. And uh, can you, uh, can any of you, um, uh, can any of you, of course Richard can, can any, Ross, can you tell us uh, whether the amphibians, reptiles and mammals, whether they're warm or cold-blooded? Uh, probably not, but I'll give it a go. Um, well, mammals warm-blooded. Ding! <laughs> hey. um, and I, the rest of them probably mainly cold-blooded. I would. I would Ding! Guess. What about what about fish? Again, most mostly cold-blooded. Mostly cold-blooded. In fact, in fact, up until up until like May, um, everybody thought all fish were cold-blooded, but they found. The truly, the first truly endothermic, um, that's warm-blooded fish. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about it. Now, now, now before everybody gets bound, bound, there has been, there are certain certain other um, fish or um, that do have certain parts of them. Like there's certain, there's certain sharks who, who have, they've got warm, they warm their brains or warm their eyes and stuff like that. But this is a proper... Proper circulatory, warm-blooded, like like we would have, uh, and it's a fish called opa, um, or commonly known as the moonfish, and I have a wonderful uh, picture of one, which I will just uh, I, I must uh, apologise to everybody this week because uh, I'm I'm working on some slightly degraded technical um, things, which is why I haven't got my bar up. Let's just see if this works. Uh, yep. So this is your this is the moonfish or opa. Um, I, I think I know why they're called it that. <laughs> well, it's also called it's also also called the sunfish. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, and, and 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 it's probably called the earthfish as well. Anything that's anything that's round or spheroid shape. Anyway, um, so it's it's uh, it's a ship. It's a right. You you might want to explain this to me, um, uh, Ross. No, Richard. Its genus is Lampreys. 
Now, what's his genus? What does that uh, mean in the uh, terms of species thing? Well, first of all, you have to say about fish. Stephen Jay Gould famously said, there's no such thing as a fish. In fact, I think he had a book saying there's no such thing as a fish because fish is just a colloquial term. It doesn't, biologically, it doesn't mean anything. So you can have fish who are as far removed, far distantly related from each other as a human is from a sponge, basically. You can, you know, fish are that diverse. There's, it's not meaningful in any way other than things with scales in the sea, basically. And that's that's kind of the only thing that they have in common. So Is that, is that the same with birds as well? Like bird is a generic term for feathers? Yeah, less, less, less so because that does actually sort of go along a, a taxonomical phyla. Yeah. So it is a word that describes a group. And like also, them. what I heard today on Radio 4's Science Now programme... Uh, did you hear that? About monkeys, yeah, yeah. Monkeys. All, all apes are monkeys, but not all monkeys are apes. That's right. Clever. But although they did say at the end, the people who are saying, when you use uh, monkey to describe an ape, they're still, they're still right because when, they, when they object to that, because it's like it's using a, a very broad term. Yeah. It, it, you're just narrowing the term down to be more specific, so they are right to, to do that. It's not a sci- monkey is not a scientific term. Well, weren't they saying that it did roughly fit something specific, but you could use it more broadly? Because, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, it's just a, it's just a phyla, basically. You've got a, it's just a, a, a taxonomical arrangement naming convention. Um, so that's, that's the like larger group up from species. That, I knew you'd know the answer. Anyway, so, because I, 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 for some reason, I, I've got a, I've got a. A, a huge block about understanding about the species, and it's very—it's something very simple, but I can't quite grasp. Because is there is there no such thing as a subspecies? It's just another species. Well, this is the thing with it. All the the, the definitions are debated all the time because, as they went into on that Radio Four show, um, the the most easy to use definition is if two species can't interbreed. Ah, uh, uh, that's what they said. Yes. You know, two animals can't interbreed, therefore they're separate species. Um, so that's generally used, but it doesn't always quite work. So that's why you start to have a subspecies where they're very different, but they can technically still breed. So they say, okay, it's not a separate species, so we'll call it a subspecies. So like humans and Neanderthal, basically. They're thought of as separate species. Which is what the example they said, isn't it? Because we know for a fact that they interbred, you know, the average person has 3% yeah. Neanderthal DNA or what have you. Um, yeah. They, they're not, not really a separate species in that sense. No. So, so anyway, if, if I go back to Opa, I'll, I'll, I'll get it back up on the screen again. Um, the, some of the differences, so, well, first off, where you can find it. It's a, it's a, it's a deep water fish, or reasonably deep water fish, anything, anywhere between 50 metres and 500 metres. Um, largely found off the coast of America, around Hawaii. Um, well, that, a, one's, that one's definitely not as 50 or 500 metres, is it? <laughs> no, 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 because... You can see the sun, <laughs> but actually, I've got a, I've got a, a, I've got a little YouTube video. I wonder if I could show you that now, actually, because um, this was this is the people who kind of sort of found it. Let's, oh, yeah, yeah. Let's just get rid of the commentary. But that is it, swimming around. Well, it's actually caught on a line, poor thing. What's <laughs> surprising about this though is John that how how come it's, it, I mean that's a reasonably well known. Fish, isn't it? The sunfish is quite, you know, they're quite reasonably common and well known as far well, as well. They're not well. So they're not really that common. I think that I think <laughs> the sunfish. I think they, there's, there's multiple pe- things called the sunfish. Right. I don't think they're all this one. So it's this particular one, obviously. Yeah, because obviously colloquialism again, like you say, it, on the coast of Indonesia, they might have a sunfish. It might not be this one because it looks yeah. like a sun. Yeah. It must um, be that. It must be that. But it's this. Game, this quite an iconic fish, isn't it? But that. Yeah. Man, so this op- this opa seems to be quite it keeps its like to keep itself to itself. So it's very rarely at this level, at this surface level, where you can see the sun coming through. So um, the, the th- one of the in, the thing the interesting things about it is these, these pectoral fins here. You'll see. Let's have a look and go in here. These pectoral fins, like most of them, they actually droop droop on most fish. They'll droop down. They'll be down by the side. But these are vertical. Uh, sorry, they're horizontal. They come out. Like a, like a cross, as right, it were. Yeah, they're stiff. And um, 
that's that's one of its uh, it's one of its its traits, which is not not found many other places. Uh, other things about it is it's toothless, uh, but the main thing, obviously, is that it is endothermic. So it's um, it it has arteries uh, that carry like we you know like we do carry warm blood from uh, from the heart, and it goes through these gills, which are the gills, and uh, and basically just acts like a radiator. So there's the, obviously the gills are next to the cold water, uh, so the blood in there, in that part will be cold, and it pumps it around, and the 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 warm blood replaces it, heats it all up. So uh, in, in in terms of warm blood and cold blood, is that is that in relation to the environment they live in? Is that what the definition is? Yeah, well they think they basically they yeah they they think that they can that this can maintain its body temperature about five degrees more than what in whatever environment it is in by using this method. So it's it's always is relative to where it is. So it's yeah. it's you know if it's if it's in really deep part it's fa it's like up to five degrees warmer within its body than the surrounding sea. So what what's the I've never, I've never really thought about this, but what's the difference between a warm blooded and a cold blooded creature then? Like what in terms of well that, is that adva adva I know in terms of advantages it's like one is one more advantageous in certain environments or easier to feed or you know what I mean what's the well, cold 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 is normally more advantageous because you just kind of roll them with it so if the if the environment's x temperature and you can survive in that temperature that's great and you're not using any energy to maintain that you just roll them with the x you just but obviously the advantage of being able to regulate it is I don't know for instance your muscle can spring into action faster if it's at the optimal temperature Mm, your body's yeah. rather than so you can get a burst of speed and get away from that it's that sort of thing but there's a huge cost because a, a warm-blooded animal has to keep its metabolism fueled at all times yeah so, so an interesting question is of course of, of, you know, we, we we've all come at some point in our evolutionary past we've all come from fish um, and we are warm-blooded so and the fish are cold-blooded is this somewhere in that path is this something being trapped in an evolutionary path. Well, things things evolve um, convergently, don't they? So you, you could just have this happening. Doesn't necessarily just because warm blooded warm bloodedness will have occurred hundreds of times. So it just depends on when it acquired that trait. It could have acquired that trait back when we did, or it could have it could have acquired that trait later, even um, or very much earlier. It just, it just depends. So, in, in terms of the other, you know, reptiles and, and that sort of thing, have we found warm-blooded reptiles, or are they warm-blooded bird? Well, b reptiles. birds are warm-blooded, aren't they? Reptiles are cold. So, <clears throat> so yeah, could, could we find a warm-blooded reptile? Uh, well, I guess like, I guess you could. Any species as examples, any there could be species of that. What's the What's what's reptile amphibian? What's one of yeah, I mean, that, that whole group, I don't know offhand, but that whole group might be a relatively young group, so you might expect that they'd all be cold because they're all closely related. Right. That that reptile probably is, I think, is a more well-defined biological group than fish is definitely. Yeah. Fish is yeah. just kind of doesn't mean anything at all biologically. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that 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 fish could be more more closely related to us, like John was alluding to. That could be warm blooded and more closely related to us than some other cold blooded fish potentially. So I think I think it's it's when you when you see a picture like that and when you know certain characteristics like the fact it's warm blooded and the fact that their the pectoral fins are horizontal you you immediately as a human you're, you're trying to what's the uh, what's the phrase for trying to put our uh, ourselves on uh, on morphizing yeah 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 so you're trying to think. Oh, well, maybe this is the the bit before we crawled onto land. But you, I, you, like you say, lots of things happened in parallel. I mean, they the will. It's just that I don't know. They will know. They will know roughly where this, how old this species is, and where it fits on the tree of life, and if it fits closer to us, will, that will be known. It's probably on Wikipedia. You can probably find that. Yeah, out. it was. The, it was actually the national, the U.S. National Ocean Oceanographic uh, and Atmospheric Administration who did, who found. Did the research and found this um, 
There was a, there's a, actually, I wonder if I've got it. There was a particularly strange picture on uh, on one of the page where it's basically this 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 fish on an operating table with what looks like an oxygen pipe in his mouth. <laughs> it's very weird, <laughs> but I don't so think it is. I don't the more important there. question: What does it taste like? Um, quite <laughs> well. I can answer this because <laughs> because uh, obviously not personally vegetarian and everything. Um, but um, basically, they've, they've started to become prize, um, a prized catch of the of the deep sh deep sea fishers fishermen, mm -hmm. and a, and a, they've started a, a lot of the deep sea tuna trawlers have started to pick them up because they 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 they're quite they're known as like a solitary fish, but they have been known to sort of tag along with shoals of tuna, mm -hmm. so they start picking it up, and by all accounts. It's um, it's a it's a dark flesh. It's a dark uh, flesh that when you cook it goes pale, very pale, and it's um, it's quite a, a, a sort of a, a light taste with a with a sort of a subtle mustard tang. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. good with a nice Chianti. I kind of thought I thought you might say that it was more meaty because that's kind of where my mind was going with yeah. it. Is hemoglobin not associated with like meaty type of flavors? I don't know. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, that's uh, that, going back to what that meatless the thing that we were saying. They were saying that that heme heme's the bit that oh, they. Right, that's, that's where I heard that fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> On here. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're now we're now remembering things that we've done in the past and thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a Where's cyclical that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but yeah, it, I, I guess it. I guess it has. It's it's slightly more. More of a meaty, uh, a deeper flavour. Um, but you know, but if you're interested in that, get down to your local fisheries. Uh, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll drag one over from Hawaii. So have they speculated what the advantage is in this situation for it to be warm blooded? They're not, they not, they not know that yet. They don't, they don't know that yet. Basically, the, it is, it's. It, I think it was a surprise they weren't looking for it, and uh, it's so now, now they've got to do. You know, they've got to get some. It's an outlier in the environment, isn't it, in terms of everything else there. Everything else that's deep, presumably, is cold. -blooded. Well, other than the ones we haven't discovered yet, but everything else that we know of is cold-blooded. So it's it's in a bit of a niche there, isn't it? It is indeed. Um, I, let me just see if I can f if I, if I think there's a, a dissection of one of these. So let me have a look. I suppose whales go whales can go pretty deep, and they're they're warm, of course. So let's see if we've got a oh mistyped it. Do you mean opera? No, I don't mean opera. <laughs> Let's see if we've got any pictures. But, uh, cold blooded, Ross, going back to what you were saying before while John's looking that up, obviously if you're cold blooded you don't have to think about hibernation and things like that. You, you could just you can you can just be cold blooded and you don't have to worry about that. Whereas you have to kind of hibernation is is a warm blooded adaption to try and get some of the advantages of and it, does, it doesn't work as well as being cold blooded because it just slows it right, right down. Yeah. Um, so there you go. It's um, that's that's a steak of opa. That looks um, that it's does got, look it's, tasty. It's a high. It's got a high fat content because that's another reason it's got, it can keep its body temperature. It's got a layer of fat. Um, so there you go. Well, presumably it needs the layer of fat to reduce the energy. That it needs to maintain that temperature, doesn't it? Because if you're cold blooded, you don't need to really worry about that. Well, that's it. Yeah, it generates. It, it, this is another thing with those pectoral fins as well. It generates all of its heat from the muscles around there, um, and and obviously it wants to maintain that. Once it's generated it inside, it wants to keep it in. So that that's you know, it's good to have that fat layer. Well, um, next time I'm done at Collar's Chippy, I'll uh, I'll see if it's on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I know what he's say. <laughs> Do you want? Do you want fries with that? <laughs> right. Okay. That's enough of uh, of uh, strange deep sea um, endothermic fish. Um, and now we'll go on to Ross, who is going to talk to me something about. I have to say, completely passed me by the Centralia mine fire. Yeah. This is just another one. Of this. this is nothing in the news or anything. This is just another interesting thing that I came across that we've talked about sort of producing um, energy and coal and this sort of thing, and this just piqued my interest. So, um, so yeah, Centralia, basically this is a borough in Columbia County, Pennsylvania, America. Um, 
and they start off with mining in 1856, um, and they had sort of three, three, three mines there, um, and basically, you know, a mining <coughs> community. Um, and in 1890, there was 2,761 people living there, so you know, quite happily doing their jobs and that. Um, however, in 1962, there was a fire started. Now, there's a, there's a few arguments as to what started this fire, but the most likely cause is that um, before Memorial Day, they have a big tidy up. Um, and in 1962 in May, what the council did was they hired five members of a fire, fire, local fire uh, company um, to tidy up the landfill. Um, and the way they did that was they set on fire, which, you know, seemed like a good idea. Unfortunately, what happened was the fire actually entered one of the seams of the pit, and basically the the, the, the coal seam caught fire. Please, sir. Please, yeah. sir. I think I know this. I think I know the outcome of this one. Ah, I've just yes. thought about it. Uh, Carry well. on. Carry on. So basically, yeah. Obviously, that, that's not a good thing. Um, so what they did was they thought, right, we would better put this fire out. So they started one of well, the first of three projects to try and put the fire out. So in August, um, they excavated about 60,000 or 50,000 cubic meters of earth to try and put this fire out. Um, unfortunately, they ran out of money in October after spending an estimated $20,000 on it. Um, so so the, fire, the fire's entirely underground at this point, then, and it's been raging for a long time? I'll get out of yeah, basically, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously it, it started off small, so they this, this tried to stop it. Um, they started a second project that it, they decided that they would flush it, flush it with water. Um, so basically try and put it out by pumping water down there. Um, unfortunately that project ran out of money in March 1963 after spending $40,000. Um, and then in April that year, the mine fire had actually spread um, about 200 meters from its original starting place, and there was steam starting to come up. So they had a third project that they started that ended up costing 300,000, or was going to cost $300,000, um, but they didn't do that, and they abandoned that in 1963. And, and, uh, and, they, and, and basically just left it burning. Can the, pu the punchline is it's still burning to this day? It is still burning. Um, basically in 1979, the locals became aware of the scale of the problem, um, there was a petrol station owner, who was actually the mayor as well, was checking the level of his of the fuel tank, and when he took it out, he thought it was a bit hot, so he put a thermometer down into his fuel tank, um, and the temperature was 78 degrees. Um, and then later on, um, what was the next year, 1982, um, there was a 12-year-old lad who fell into a hole, um, and when they pulled him out, basically there was there was steam coming out after him. Um, wow! So they got him, they got him out alive, though. They got him out alive, yeah. And so anyway, what what the, the U.S. Congress decided to do in 1984 was they allocated 42 million dollars to actually relocate all of the residents. Um, most of them, obviously, they accepted and moved out. A few people stayed. Um, then by 1992. Hang on, how long has the fire been going at this point? Since 1961? 1963. When they say fire, do they just mean like smouldering on then? I mean, no, 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 it's, 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 it's raging fire. It's on fire. What, down coal it, it, It's just down the coal Well, basically, there's no way to put it out. They can't put it out. But you know the, you know the fire, so it's underground, so it obviously doesn't have a rich oxygen supply then, so it's, it's just smouldering away then, is it? Well, the coal steams, there'll be, there'll be sort of, there'll be gaps and there'll be caves and there'll be all sorts of things down there. It'll not, it's not solid. Right. Um, and, and there'll be, there'll be down the presumably, there's, presumably there's oxygen trapped as well. Yeah, yeah. So basically the bit that's exposed is on fire and then that, once that's consumed, it moves it further and further in. Yeah, yeah, right, basically. right. So it could be like a quite trivial sized fire, but it's just... It's well, just this, a, is, the, this is, is the thing, I mean, they... they if they'd actually put the more effort and money into putting out in the first place, they may have put it out, they may not have done, but, um, but I mean, basically, yeah, it's still going up. In 1992, um, uh, oh no, not 2002, they actually re removed the zip code from Centralia, so the, the postcode doesn't exist anymore. 
um, and, and evicted the, the residents who were there. Um, and then it extended underneath another town, which is a few miles to the southeast. So it was a town called Burnsville. That had miles. As well. Burnsville. Yeah. Burnsville was consumed. <laughs> yep. So basically, it's been burning for more than fifty years. Um, and they, 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 because of, because they can't put it out, and they don't know how long it's going to burn for. One, I found one that said it could burn for the next two hundred and fifty years. Um, and there's no way to put But the interesting thing is, it's it, it, it's one of the worst mine fires in the US, but it's not like isolated. Apparently, there's over 200 coal coal fires currently burning in 14 states in America. I think there's I think there's 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 a couple in this country as well. Mm. Only there's they actually, haven't they haven't uh, extended as much because they've hit uh, like um, bedrock and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably one of those things that's like very surprising. However, to be fair to the administration, they're probably thinking, well, what's the cost? What could the cost potentially be? It could run into the hundreds of millions or billions even. And then also, what is the risk to people? If, if it's just smoldering underground, maybe the risk is small. Well, the, the, and if you start like trying to collapse stuff and explode stuff, and maybe I mean, it's the, too risky. The risk of it is basically the, the sort of fumes coming up. There's like lethal levels of carbon monoxide there. You just like the done though, you just move everyone out rather than try to fix it and put the work as who are trying to fix it at risk. You just say, all right, we're fucked up, yeah. get out. <laughs> but I mean, Presum presumably there'll be sulfur as well because yeah, sulfur, yeah. there's a lot of that is trapped in. I mean, you think of sort of like, you know, like things like Chernobyl and, you know, places, you know, the, the, uh, Fukushima where there's been. Disasters and nuclear power plants. Everyone's heard about them in this yard, so it's an abandoned wasteland and all this. People don't know that this happens with coal mines. Yeah, that's a good know, point. And the amount of land that's been cleared that you you know you can't live in. You, apparently, it's, it's become a bit of a tourist attraction. People go there because there's they've got vents. They've installed vents, so you see steam rising out of these vents. But you're not allowed to spend much time there because obviously it is like going into a, a radiation zone because of the fumes. You can only spend so long there because it's it's lethal. Well, presumably it's it's in one sense it's more lethal than radiation because as long as you don't get a lethal dose of radiation, oh well, as long as you don't get a dangerous dose, you know, if you stay below that level, you're okay, aren't you? Whereas with something toxic, potentially you could get a small amount and be very very ill, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's because I mean radiation, I suppose, would be easier to monitor. It might be it might be easier to monitor. Yeah. Because obviously you have to get. The sort of small, small, highly radioactive particles that you get at Chernobyl, if you're not going anywhere near the actual um, power station, you'll have to get really close to them for them to actually harm you. Whereas, obviously, gas, you could just be downwind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but apparently, here's another interesting fact: the world's oldest underground fire has actually been burning for six thousand years. Which is a, um, it's a, it's a mountain in Australia called called the Burning Mountain. That basically, the, the, there's, I don't know if that's coal as well. It probably is coal, but that's basically burned off. Obviously, it would have been ignited by probably the bushfire type thing you get in, in Australia, but that's been burning for 6,000 years, apparently. I suppose it's not too different in terms of like risk to people. It's not too different to having like magma pockets close to the surface or sleeping volcanoes. It's kind of a similar similar thing, isn't it? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Just kind of just live with it, just move out of there. Yeah, yeah. And then when it when it goes across the whole of the United States, <laughs> they might they'll think, oh, well, there you go. There's a it would be gone. interesting if it had been a much larger settlement, though, wouldn't it? To see what they would have, you would have had a problem on your hands if it was in the tens of thousands, because presumably there'd be human rights rulings and all sorts of things like that, wouldn't there? And you know, people because people live on people live on tsunami risk areas, and people live in um, earthquake risk areas, and they can't be moved out by the government. So, I mean, there was, there was, I think there was ten, ten residents who basically steadfastly refused to move, and they, they, they thought it was all a conspiracy anyway. They, they didn't believe the fire was there, and they thought the government just wanted their land. Um, but in the end, they, they were forced out um, for their own safety. Uh, but yeah, it's. Um, I was going to say that. Yeah, I um, it, obviously it's uh, obviously this is this is happening all over the world. Whether wherever there's or wh wherever there, I was going to say wherever there's, there's there's a coal mine, but not necessarily. But I guess there would need some uh, some some method of ignition, and where humans are, that might be the 
the main mm. point of ignition. But uh, mm. yeah, I, 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 it's interesting when I never, I never knew what you were going to talk about when I saw, saw that. As soon as you started talking about, it, I thought I know what it is because I'd heard this before. Mm. Not about, not specifically about that one, but I've heard the the the, the whole concept about a, a, a mine that, uh, that will burn underneath. Um, and will carry on and can't be put out. So yeah, yeah, yeah. very think, interesting. Um, there was a thing about the the, t the temperature. Uh, they they obviously monitor it all the time. Um, and this picture here shows you. Uh, this is one of their monitoring tools, which is currently reading 187 degrees Fahrenheit, which is whatever that is in in real temperature. What's that on the surface then? Um, well, it'll be just as a monitoring hole, so it's it's under the surface. Right. So they've got a probe down, dangling down. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. That's reasonably hot. It is quite hot. I mean, the one thing I was wondering was, is it impractical for them to like extract this heat as a source <laughs> of energy? Yeah. But while it's burning on, can we yeah. can we have it's a burning, heat exchanger? Yeah. <laughs> It's burning for 250 years. Let's just pump some water down, and it'll come up hot. You know, or is it just that, impractical? Presumably not that predictable where it's going to be and stuff like that, is it? And installing the pipes. Yeah, just pop a nuclear bomb on it. <laughs> just blast the whole lot out. Sort it. <laughs> <laughs> At least then you know after a few hundred years it's definitely going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you could just loads of explosives, not a nuclear bomb, then just like. Tongue just buy shitloads of conventional explosives, just blow the whole. It is America after all, I love that sort of thing. <laughs> when in doubt, C4. Get the bombers on there. Fire, fire, fire. fire. <laughs> right, excellent. Well, that's an interesting, a li interesting tale of um, when mining goes bad. <laughs> um, okay, now, the last topic for this afternoon, sorry, evening. I don't know where I am. It's because it's light outside still. Um, is a good one uh, to get our teeth into, hopefully, and it's Richards, and it's a very provocative question, which is, <laughs> which is, will robots take our jobs? Hello, he we seem to have a Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it was on uh, robots, I thought I'd uh, actually had a. My my, Richard, you really need to fatten up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, th this is more of a it's it's technology, but it's um, it's more of a, a conversation piece rather than telling you about some new technology. It's um, a survey that was done by Pew Research, and they surveyed two thousand individuals with various expertise: artificial intelligence, robotics, economics, um, to just discuss their their predictions for the future of automation um, and how it will affect humans, how it will affect the job market and stuff. We touched before on the singularity and Stephen Hawking talking about his view of, of that um, and I think, was it Elon Musk who contradicted that, I think you said, Ross, yeah. but yeah. you know, there's, there's diff differing opinions in the field. Um, so this survey was to, to find out between now and 2025 what, whether people thought it would be um, optimistic or, or pessimistic about the future regarding this. Um, and basically it was split. It was 52% predicting an optimistic path, 48% worried about the future um, among experts. Uh, experts all... in quotes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the, I wonder how people in economics are experts in the development of technology. But the thing is, that it's, that's not really in dispute. They all agree that um, that that work will be taken over by robots. They all agree that um, that jobs will be displaced by robots. Um, the only the only thing that people disagree about is is that a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so it was just to solicit your opinions on that, really. Just, just for the avoidance of doubt and for clarity, we're talking about robots as in the conventional type of mechanical robot. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be mechanical, I suppose. You could just say... Or oh, electromechanical. Or... Automaton. Like, you could just say, well, algorithmic worker counts as a robot in that sense. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a humanoid machine in your home. But, but you know, 
replacing that with, with, with a physical aspect of it. Replacing humans with technology, essentially. Yeah. 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 I mean, my, my opinion on this is it's obviously it's inevitable because you know um, industrial since the industrial revolution we've been trying to replace humans with technology because it makes economic sense and you know makes your life makes your day day life easier because you're not having to put as much effort into it because you can get a machine to do the effort and so it's definitely inevitable whether or not it's a good thing or not <laughs> I think it depends on your point of view from what your job is to be honest because I mean. If you are a, a, a manual laborer who does a, a a job that is easily replicated mechanically, obviously it's going to be it's going to be a bad thing because your industry is basically under threat. Um, whereas if you're a sort of a, a creative, you know, something that would in, involve intelligence, creative things, so it's more difficult to to replicate. Um, I think you'll be fine for for a long time in the future. I think um, it, it's it's very interesting, and, the, and sort of the history of uh, automation. Um, we'll take IBM as a as a, a and yeah, we'll take we'll take IBM. So they started off as um, a tabulating company. So before the 1930s, when they started off, um, most people would be doing books by hand, so they'd be be doing accountancy by hand they'd have ledgers um, and then uh, they came up with the mechanical tabulating machines so they could do a lot of stuff so obviously there was need for less clerical staff uh, less accountants so a company who employed a whole department of accountants might only need one um, and also typewriters when it when typewriters came in, they had they had large amounts of of the secretarial clerical staff in typing pools. When the PCs came in, people were expected to type their own things from PCs, so they lost all that. Now, did those people lose their jobs? Yes, but different jobs came up mm. uh, based on that. You know, it was the same thing with the with the with the tabulators in IBM. The people who, who initially were in that and the tabulating machines came in, they lost their jobs. But the other other opportunities came on. So I guess you have to be flexible. Um and yeah, things will things will shift. Things will move around. You'll have different opportunities. It might not be what you're currently so if you if you if you're currently doing a certain thing and you and you're not prepared to change and that le that goes, then yes. There's a possible. There's a problem. I guess if you could ex expand what you're saying to even say, well, the world population was once a few, you know, not so long ago was a few hundred million people, and those people had work, and that, and, and now the world population is several billion people, and most of those people have work. Yeah. So, so there's been lots of technology revolutions in that time. You know, there's been printing presses. There's been, um, you know, machines that, well, everything. I mean. I guess mechanized farming, mechanized uh, sewing, you know, all that fat, you know, textile producing and all that. That was riots and people lost their jobs and people were displaced. But, but yet, majority of people around the world are still employed of employable age, aren't they? So, it has survived all those all those changes, I suppose. And I guess there's uh, certainly at the moment, until you get the first self-healing robot, there'll always be a human needed to replace bits of it when it wears out. I mean, do you not think the risk? Do you not think the risk? I guess that people are worried about is that if you're a if you're a socialist, um, or you just care about income equality, I guess, then you worry that it yet widens the gap more because if you're rich enough to be able to afford the robots, then that's great for you. Your life's just going to get easier. If you're poor and unskilled, then the robots just a threat to you. Basically, you're not going to gain much in your lifetime from it. Um, you know when they're new and expensive, but you are going to be at risk of being replaced by it. I guess. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, it will be. I mean, it would be interesting to see. You say like the the survey was like a fifty fifty split. Was that across? Was that just the same profession, or was it different professions of people? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was exactly fifty two and forty eight within those three categories, but the way it was presented to me was even within the artificial intelligence community, it's roughly split. Oh, right, okay. That's if it's economics, it's roughly split. So, 
it seems. But I suppose it, it, if if the question is, you know, a black and white question, and people just don't know, that's how it's going to come out, isn't it? Because no one's leaning one way or the other because you just don't know. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I mean, you know, the fact that that it isn't even split means that there's a real risk of it happening if people are that sort of in 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 not indecisive, but that way, sort of on both sides of the fence. Is, is there any particular sort of like um, area that could be automated that is considered the biggest risk to sort of like jobs? Well, like, you know, like we've seen before, any well, you know, you know better than better than anyone that the stuff that can be automated yeah. is the stuff that the supercomputers are doing now that maybe machines can't quite. But, but if that if that hurdle's already been overcome and a supercomputer can do it, it's just yeah. a matter of time till a a machine in your home of some form can do it, so you imagine that those those type of things are most at risk. Yeah. Um, I think um, I think some of the areas. I mean, I think most people would think um, of automatons who can do certain tasks. I think most people would think, well, what are the menial? What the class is the menial tasks? Yeah. yeah. What are the tasks that um, there are currently people doing now that um, the class is menial tasks, and what well, unskilled, we can... unskilled. Well, okay. Well, yeah, unskilled. We'll call it unskilled. But I mean, it, the people who are at the top will be calling them menial, menial tasks. <laughs> but yeah, unskilled tasks. Um, p- cleaning, for instance. Uh, if you're if you're cleaning an office or cleaning a workplace, can can something replace that? Well, currently, it's very hard. It it, it is. It's an unskilled job. But when when you take it. From the point of view of an automaton, it's it's multi it's complex. It's complex. It's very yeah. complex yeah. because you have got job. to do the whole job. But element elements of it have already been automated. I mean, a power washer is, I guess, a machine doing two thirds of the work for yeah. you. A cleaning product that you put in the oven and leave it for half an hour is meaning that you're not having to scrub it physically for that. T- so it's kind of already technology is kind of already doing most of the job, isn't it? I suppose that's the thing. Yeah. Is it is it more the technology? Isn't going to replace jobs, but just do that sort of thing of you know take off the not so much menial jobs, but take off the menial parts of jobs. So yeah, cleaning's a good one. Yeah, you're not actually having to put in the hard work anymore. You just sort of have to you know turn on the Roomba and spray the cleaning stuff. And and then and I, I, actually I was I was I've kind of I've, I've kind of answered one of my questions already because. Um, I was thinking, well, mm, how how would you get an automaton to clean a toilet, for instance? What are the tasks involved in that? But now I'm thinking, well, those um, those toilets that are in France, where it actually just, up, you know, you go in, you come out, and it actually turns itself upside down and cleans itself. Mm-hmm. That that's an example, and so I kind of think, well, well I've answered myself on that one. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, one of the interesting responses to the article that I read in the comment section, somebody was saying, I'm old enough to remember when when computers were first coming out and we were told then that the 40 hour week or the 30 hour week I think he was saying would become a 10 hour week or a 2 hour week because the computers would do all the work for us and then we would just have loads of leisure time but what would happen is there'd be loads of leisure industry jobs spawned to cater for the fact that people had all, all this free time on their hands he says and the opposite's actually happened we're working longer hours okay maybe less physical jobs but we're still we're still putting the hours in so he was, he was skeptical, but, but it's it's yeah. it's partially true because there is a lot more people have a lot more free time to do leisure activities. But the main thing that's gone up is not free time. The main thing that's gone up is productivity, hasn't it? Productivity has just soared. The workers are still expected to do the maximum that they can feasibly do. You know, within the <laughs> however sort of liberal the country is, I suppose. I mean, that would be maybe eighty hours in a sweatshop and. 25 hours in, in, a, in a very liberal country, but still doing quite a, you know, you're spending more of your free time at work than you are in your own time still. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, yes, yes, if you, if you, could, you could easily say, yeah, we, you know, in a factory, for example, we produce 5,000 units a month or something. If we bring in this, this machine, we'll be able to do that in a week. But that doesn't translate to we'll only work one week a month. Like you say, it means that we produce fifty thousand or five thousand. So, while while technically you could have reduced working weeks to ten hours and been just as productive, obviously you're not going to do that. You're going to go, hold on, we'll just make more. Yeah, um, just increase your productivity by, exactly, by, yeah, yeah. by profit. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that, I guess that's the thing that people worry about is that it just leads to more of the same of that. That that the the rich people who own these businesses become richer because they they increase their productivity, mm-hmm. and the the workers are left being either displaced or or what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think another, com- another comment that you might have an opinion on. Um, the experts, a lot of the experts, agreed on that education needs to change for this world that we're going to live, inevitably live in, because um, it's saying, well, only the best educated humans will compete with machines, um, but also that we're still teaching in a very 20th century kind of way. We're still teaching people like as if they're going to work in a factory. You know, if you're in the classroom, it's sitting columns. It's still now like that, isn't it? That yeah. Don't talk up, just listen to what you're being told, take that on board. You're kind of teaching people in a way that a machine learns, and a machine's always going to be people in that setting. You need to kind of adapt the education to be the people of the future to fit what a machine can't do, basically. That's, yeah. that's where you want to send, that's how you want to educate people of your country to be able to compete against machines. You don't want to try and beat them at punching holes in a piece of wood because you're just not going to be able to, are you? I think it's the, it's the it's the lateral thinking where humans are good at, isn't it? It's the it's the stuff that is on the the outside parameters of logic, yeah. where it's logic, but also takes in other things like environment um, and other things that. that any, sort, happen- any sort of creativity. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I still think it's a matter of. Personally, I I kind of have a. a a little bit of a mechanistic view of evolved creatures as well. I think we are we are ultimately just biomechanical. You know, we we are we are evolved to do the job well. And so, if you can you can make, presumably eventually make a computer do everything as well, a machine do everything as well. So I think it's I just mean, it's you, say. You know, a shrinking. Um, you know, there's things yeah. that are like the creative things, like you say, but Deep Blue famously beat. A grand chess master, I mean, it's possible to do it, isn't it? If you put enough investment in it. Just thinking in terms of industry, I imagine that the car, car building industry is probably the one that's, to me, seems like it's embraced and went forward with automation because surely all large car industries are, the cars are basically put together by robots. And it's only the sort of specialized, expensive, hand crafted cars that you hear about. Yes, I hear. I hear there's a, they've got an electric screwdriver on the Morgan plant at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> They're tiling it out. They don't like it very much. <laughs> but I think what what maybe's happened there is I don't I don't really know that industry very well. But I'm guessing what's what's happened there is maybe the labour force hasn't gone down and they've embraced the machines. But presumably you had people doing the skilled draftman type jobs were kind of middle class people in that society. And now everyone, okay, they're still engineers. Don't get us wrong, I'm not saying that. But, you know, in the factories in the Far East, you've just got unskilled workers and then the machines. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of done away with a lot of the more skilled jobs. So I guess that's where it's a, a particular threat is potentially this next evolution of machines targets those jobs. Um, so you lose, you know, you, people become then unskilled, it's actually making people more unskilled. Mm-hmm. I guess that's the unique threat behind it. So in terms of in terms of our sort of collective industry working with, with mainly with computers, networks, that sort of thing, do you think our our industry is in any way threat, I suppose? Definitely. I mean well cloud computing is. I mean mm. when I started I was a hardware technician essentially and yeah, there's not many of them around now because yeah. you've had, had to change with the with the times, that's the thing. Yeah, and it, you know, and then the next stage of my career has been in data centers and you know maintaining server farms and things like that. And now that's all the next phase for that is for it to all be in well, sort of owned by a few conglomerates. So exactly, I mean, I, I, in my, in my, in my, my current job, the DevOps job that I'm doing, I've never seen a server. Mm-hmm. Don't care really about them. <laughs> <laughs> Just know that. So, so it's making so it's making your life easier because you don't have to deal with you're more dealing with the the network, the the, the, the way it works, rather than hardware failures and, and the the menial parts of that job of most, replacing a physical drive. Amazingly, sort of most of most of my day is st- well, I would say statistical analysis, but a lot of. Um, monitoring uh, and analysis of, of logs and data that's coming in from the servers 
and reacting with what I'm seeing and spinning up servers or not spinning up servers or I mean a machine know. can definitely do that yeah uh, exactly exactly it's just a matter of time I mean that's probably just economies of scale that it, it, it get, I guess at this point there's not a big enough marketplace to justify that product but once you know once the other marketplaces have been exhausted someone will turn their attention to that and say okay well do we really need analysts doing all this or can we can the machines become the yeah, analysts yeah. in which case from my point of view I'll go and do something else yeah. When was the last time you actually dealt with physical hardware then, John? Um, oh, that would have been April. Uh, April. Mm -hmm. April when I left my old job. Uh -huh. So the last time I looked in a data center would have been April, and that was the just to, to do a handover. Um, but yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, I'm 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 in in Amazon space. And you're embracing it. I'm embracing it. I love it. Love it. Yeah. So, I, I, providing that, that that humans have the capacity to learn and have the capacity to to find out where the little bits, the the bits that small between the cracks and move into those bits, um, I I think that the future is well as it is now. Really, and people will people will always move into you know entrepreneurs will always go. Okay, we've got A and we've got, you know, C. How do I find B? Where's B? What's the bit that nobody's doing here? What the bit that, that can't be done by a robot or? I guess. The, doing... I guess maybe the worry is if you project far. I mean, this was only to 2025. I'm guessing if you made that projection, what do you think of 2100? I'm I'm guessing that people will be more pessimistic about that because, like you're saying, in the next few decades, yes, that's true, but. If what I'm saying is right, and it's just a matter of time until a machine can do pretty much everything, then that space that you can actually move into shrinks, you know, by the year. And then, is there a lot? Is there a lot on offer that you could actually get into that by the time you've learned that the machine isn't already doing it? I guess is that. I think, I think the one thing I would say is that the timescales will be a lot longer than what people actually think. Because I mean, while as has been now. Yeah, while while technically you, you, you can do a lot of things, it moves slower than what you think it's going. I mean, we're supposed to have flying cars this year, aren't we? Going to Back to the Future. Yeah, we've got a, we've got hoverboards now. Though. Did you see? We that? have. Well, what the Lexus one? Yeah, you didn't see them stepping it though. It's no, just a but... it's just a maglev thing, though, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So you still lot. have to have a a floor, which is yeah, got metal in it. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not what a, I was it's promised. Still it's still working. Exactly. I'm I'm yeah. I'm still looking for a true holographic projection television that we had in Star Wars the very first you know, the very first or the third episode. But I think uh, but I think that model will shift because that's the whole theory behind the singularity is that mm. that you you can make massive jumps forward if if you get if you get to a learning computer a proper learning computer which we haven't yeah. quite got yet. I mean that that is going to be a, a, yeah. a turning point in terms of computing when you have it turned on its head when you get that stage. Yeah, definitely. So, yes, I, th I think that's when it's going to be a unique threat. At the moment, yeah. it's analogous to the printing press or whatever. It's that kind of level of threat. But once it gets to the point where it can learn dynamically, the system itself can. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably where it poses a unique threat, doesn't it? Very good. And I think that's about time that we uh, we wind up tonight uh, with a, a very good... Uh, actually, I'm just wondering whether we should do... One of those topics, um, one of an episode where we just discuss something and just let go with it. Um, thing is, is, you need to have something that's that's as meaty as <laughs> it's back again. <laughs> Woo! I'm, I'm, um, glad, I'm, glad we, I'm glad we didn't end that on like a proper pessimistic note, though, because as we have done a few times recently, yeah, no, Richard going last has been a bit of a downer, <laughs> but you know, we're, we're all optimistic. So it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I've got the army soundboard going. <laughs> okay, well, um, th thanks everybody for uh, for uh, for watching this week's um, episode. I'm hopefully I'll get my technical gremlins fixed for next week, and I'll have my little my little title bar, and uh, I won't look like that I'm being lit by uh, like the sun <laughs> because <laughs> I've got a great look, just off camera is like the great fiery ball here. What? Yeah. It looks like you're under a sunbed. Yeah, it does. 
yeah, I've got something wrong with the camera and my computer and everything. And uh, I'd just like to say um, thank you very much, uh, Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Arnie. No problem. <laughs> Rick, we, we, we've missed uh, mentioning SpaceX's... Um, Oh yeah, yeah. Less, less than successful um, third attempt at uh, Yeah, we well, see that. There. That's what I was going to do as my topic, um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, and it blew up. <laughs> it blew up. So, uh, well, I was going to do the the hoverboard, but I'm glad that I didn't because he's both poo pooed it. So that would have been. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks again. If anybody wants, to, I, I I can't I can't even flick me little me little bar across to see tell everybody what we've got. But uh, essentially. Feedback is welcome, um, Rob. I've I've I found your uh, what you the question that you asked, and I'll have I'll have a look at it for next week. Um, come to wonderofstuff.blogspot.com if you want to give us some stuff. That's where you'll find all of the episodes that have gone before, show notes, uh, read books that we've been reading, uh, bits about us, etc. Uh, or wonderofstuff at gmail.com if you want to give us some feedback or Twitter. Um, so uh, until next time everybody uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, and very much goodbye bye bye